Okay, welcome to Micro Computer Systems 1. Uh, this is the first lecture in the series for this semester. Um, so um, this is probably not the ideal way to do this, but uh, hopefully we can make it work. Uh, this is my favorite course. I really enjoy teaching it, and I think students really enjoy it as well. Um, it is going to be a little more challenging, but I think we have enough things in place that this is going to be a great semester. Um, spent a fair amount of time this summer getting things ready so that we can have um, a really good set of parts and everything that we need. So, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, talk a little bit of a brief introduction, and then I'll go over the syllabus. I'll look at Blackboard and kind of show you what's on there, and then I'm just going to start with the kind of the, the, the initial lecture. Um, I still have some of the things to update on Blackboard. Uh, the dates for turning in homeworks, uh, they're correct in the syllabus, but they're not, the, the turn in links are not set up yet. Don't let that upset you. We'll, I'll get all that done. Hopefully I'll work on some tonight, some tomorrow, and hopefully by late tomorrow or latest Wednesday sometime I'll have all the links for all my courses uh, updated. Um, the uh, I found out last night that you can no longer upload videos to Blackboard, at least directly. So uh, what I'm doing is uh, posting them to YouTube, and I'll put the link to the YouTube uh, video on Blackboard, um, and that'll be in the folder that says videos for F20. Uh, so, uh, and that's probably good because uh, I do know that the um, that the videos download much better off of YouTube than they do off of Blackboard. We had a lot of problems in the spring with students not being able to to get videos to download very well. So, uh, so I think this is, even though it was a little shocking uh, to find this out last night. Um, fortunately, I was already pretty well set up on YouTube, so that's what we'll do. Um, okay, so I. My personal belief is that uh, that microprocessors are sort of the ultimate hands-on uh, um, learning experience. You 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 can read about them until you're blue in the face, but until you actually um, put one on a printed circuit board, connect it up uh, so that you can program it and start writing code in an integrated development environment, start hooking up wires to the microprocessor from other devices and begin to actually use it to interact with your real-world environment uh, using the code that you've written, uh, you, really, you really haven't lived. I, I think that's really important. Um, I think I'm going to change this real quick. Uh, this is such a... Uh, well, maybe it'll be okay. Uh, this video is a little laggy, uh, and I don't know if that drives you crazy. I may have to switch to a different program that's not so laggy. But anyway, uh, so here we are. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to shrink this down and I'm going to first uh, go over the syllabus. Um, and let's see, it is right here. No, that's, uh, yeah, no. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that is it. Oh, no. Here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so here's the syllabus. So the syllabus has, uh, the university put out a template they wanted us to use. It was 32 pages. Um, so uh, I've tried to do most of it, but uh, there are some things in here uh, left over when I went through and edited everything for logic design. And I didn't get every, I didn't get absolutely everything changed out. But So if you see something that sounds like logic design in a group project, just you can ignore that. But otherwise, the syllabus is pretty much right on. Uh, so... First off, the course. This is this is this course is listed as a, a fully online asynchronous for the lecture part and face to face for the lab part. So I did get permission uh, by writing a justification for the university to uh, approve me to do this uh, the lab part of this course face to face. Now they also, after they told me that I could do it face to face, they also told you that you didn't have to come. And they kind of left it just like that. Me exper expecting that you have to come and you being told you don't have to. So that has created a little bit of a little bit of a problem. 
And and so I think it is the bottom line is the university is going to stick by both of those parts. I have to teach it face to face, but you don't have to come. And so how are we going to do that? Well, that's a good question. So what I'm what I'm planning is for those of you so so everything is made so you can do it at home. Uh, and uh, the only problem is getting the equipment to the people that are going to do it at home. So some of you have already figured this out. I sent an email out last night to, or no, Sunday night to everybody. I guess that was last night. And uh, I, or maybe it was Saturday night. Anyway, I created a course on Facebook. Uh, sorry. I created a, uh, um, um, I, on a, I used eBay and I created a store and I put on there a kit that contains all the parts we're going to use in this course. And I'm going to go over all those parts in just a second. Well, actually, they're right here. So let me just go through them. So here are all the parts. Now, I, I there were some problems doing that. One of them was uh, uh, I initially put on 30 uh, that you that up to 30. I could sell up to 30, and then I realized, oh my God, I, I don't really have 30 snaps on hand. So the whole snap thing, which is the programmer that allows you to write code and download it to your board. It, it, this is, uh, it's kind of a little bit on back order, uh, and uh, I'm working a deal with Microchip to get these snaps at a reduced cost. And uh, the guy that's uh, handling the academic portion for Microchip Incorporated uh, has had cancer, and now he survived it. He's doing great. He's disease free, which I'm really excited about. But he kind of went, uh, he kind of went offline for a while, and now he's kind of back online and raring to go. So this is wonderful and I'm excited for him and I, I'm really happy to have the support again. So instead of me just going out and buying these uh, for $24 a piece plus shipping and tax, I'm, I'm going to make them, you know, I'm hopefully going to get them a lot cheaper. So I'm planning on selling them to you for, for no more than $10 and I might, and maybe even less than that, but no more than $10. Uh, but if you just went out and bought this, it would cost you uh, $24. The little Viva board kit, so here's how we put that together. Uh, uh, one of my former students, uh, well, back when he was a student, laid out the initial board many, many, uh, uh, several, I don't know, uh, eight or nine years ago. It's been a long time now. And then we, we made those. Uh, in fact, the very first uh, devices, uh, let me show you what we used to do. Just so you can appreciate how far we have come. Ah, yes. So uh, let's see. Maybe I'll turn this on. Uh, yeah. And I'll switch here. I'll blow this back up. And I'll switch cameras here. And I'll turn on the light. This was. This was our original board, uh, a piece of a uh, piece of perf board, and on here we had a uh, a, a a pick chip. This was this was a uh, a pick 16F1825, uh, uh, I think. Um, we had a voltage regulator. We had um, a pull-up resistor on the master clear. We had a six pin programming header we had a, a bypass capacitor and we had an led with a current limiting resistor and then if i turn this over the students had we glued all these parts on and then the students had to solder the connections on the back side and you can see there were loose connections wires flipping around the potential for things to short out all over the place this was a god-awful mess now there were a handful of students that in fact, could solder these together and get and got them working just fine. Um, my my board, some of these original boards I made are still working just fine, and they, they actually look pretty good because I had a lot of experience soldering and I knew how to, to do this very carefully. But oh my gosh, there were just a lot of problems. You can see even here, uh, crossed wires, wires shorting out. You can see here this this wire, this this came completely loose, and it's just kind of hanging here. Uh, I'm not even sure what it was connected to, uh, but it's just kind of hanging there. Uh, and so as you can imagine, these didn't really work that well. So 
that's why that's why we uh, uh, designed a printed circuit board and it turned out the first one was a whole lot simpler than what we have now and it was a great improvement and, and almost all the, I'd say all the students got their boards working and used them for for many labs you can imagine using this little board for labs uh, it wouldn't work very well because it was so unreliable and uh, if you put it down and pushed on it a little bit you'd short everything out uh, you'd probably have a fire instead of an experiment so uh, and then over the years that was rev one we're now up to revision uh, uh, 4.4 I think yeah I think 4.4 that's the current board and I'll show you that one um, here is the uh, Let's see if I can find it. So here's our here's our current board. Actually, that's not. That's actually revision 4.3. It's almost identical. Oh, sorry, you can't see it. Let's put this back up, and we will um, switch cameras again. So this is this is um, This is the current board. Well, it's upside down. This is the current board, except the except that we made a couple of changes. We we changed where. No, I guess on this one, all the only thing we did on this one, we 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 there are four touch buttons up here that spell out UTSA, but you can you can only barely see them on this board. There you can see them there, but we we uh, we made them white so you can see them really well on the new boards. Um, which I thought I had one here, but I don't. Um, the when we when we get, when we d we laid this board out ourselves and we send it off to China, and we get back a board that looks like this, nothing on it, and then we take it out of my garage and we pick and place all the service mounted parts on it, and when we get done with that, um, then it looks like I will show you. It looks like this. And you can see the UTSA on this one. And um, yeah, so so that's the yeah that's pretty good. I don't know if this will help or not. Anyway, no. And so, but there there's there's a bunch of through hole parts. You can see all the little holes in the board where you can see through it, and all those holes have parts that have to go on there. And so, what we do is for four dollars you get this board with with the microprocessor on it and all the resistors, the voltage regulators, all the surface mount parts, the four, uh, the three color uh, LED, the two LEDs that tell you that the power's on, uh, all that's all set. Uh, and then we have a bag of parts and we have, and these are the parts that have to be soldered on. And it kind of looks like this. I'll sort of do this kind of roughly. So we have two 10 pin headers that go on either side of the main chip, like that, and then we have uh, we have a a power connector here that you can plug into, and this is the plug that goes into that power connector. You can solder that onto this end of this battery snap, so you can have a nine volt battery powering your device, or you can take this same plug and instead of soldering onto that, you can solder it onto a USB plug. Um, and uh, you can find an old mouse that doesn't work anymore, cut off the cord, and hook the, the main USB plug. Uh, you can hook the black and the, uh, and the red wires and cut out the middle two wires and, uh, and use this as a plug to power your board with USB power. Um, then there are uh, some headers. Um, let's see. Oh, this one got all bent up. And it's interesting. So there's a, a six pin header that goes, uh, I think it goes right here. There's a five pin header that goes over here. This header is where the, uh, the CR2102 dongle plugs into it. And, and that, that dongle then uh, is used to, to let the UART on the microprocessor send out signals, get converted to USB language and sent to a laptop so you can send things back and forth from a laptop uh, our desktop using a terminal window. Um, then uh, these plugs let you connect to any of the pins on the chip. These two uh, double row uh, 
10 pin plugs uh, and then we have this analog header over here where we can plug in our little analog board I'll show you that in a minute and this has power ground and then it has three analog input pins uh, then we also have uh, a little terminal block that is the output of a two transistor switch that's on the board and that two transistor switch uh, can be turned on and off by just connecting one of your pins from the microprocessor to this uh, to this uh, this little two pin female connector there and I don't know if you can see that it's sort of hard to see uh, but anyway it's 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 right there and and then you can get battery voltage out of this jack and ground so you can put on like a, a buzzer uh, that takes a little more than five volts to operate if you have a nine volt battery then it'll make a good noise but with five volts it doesn't really um, and then we have a programming header which plugs in right here this is a six pin header and we put this in here and that's where we connect our programmer the snap and uh, and then we have a couple of three pin headers one of them up here I don't know if I can get these plugged in or not without dropping everything yep there's one and then the other one's down here okay those three pin headers and we have little shorting block shorting jumpers that short two of the pins together we've got one for each of those headers and we can short up here and pick whether we want to drive the microprocessor with 3.3 volts or 5 volts and we have two uh, voltage regulators right there one that regulates the input voltage say 9 volts from a battery to 5 volts or to 3.3 volts and uh, and and so you can jump or select either voltage but you still have the other voltage available on the unselected pin if you want to use it for an external device for power for an external device and then um, we have a switch here and the switch uh, it's not an on off switch even though it kind of looks like one what it does it switches from battery power to the to powering it from the uh, from the CR2102 dongle the CR2102 brings in 5 volts and 3.3 volts and so uh, so this is another way of powering the board without using the regulators are the are the uh, the the power input jack and one thing that I need to remind everybody if you have it hooked up to a 9 volt battery and you and you plug that in with that, that plug into here the whole time it's plugged in it will be powering these regulators so if you leave it in overnight it, it will run your battery down so you have to unplug it to, to turn it off and likewise if you have it plugged into your computer with a 2102 dongle the board will be powered regardless of the position of the switch uh, so you you have to disconnect the dongle from the either your lap your laptop or from your board uh, the 2102 dongle in order to turn it off it doesn't really have an on off switch it's kind of one of the things we'll fix in the next revision um, and the next revision we're going to make a bigger board and put some extra stuff on it uh, and then there's one more little thing uh, a little push button over here that goes in right there and that little push button uh, can be if the jumper set in the right position it'll be a master clear reset switch and if it's set in the other position then it generates an input on pin RB7 uh, and it has capacitors and pull-up resistors on it and everything to make that work and that's that's everything that's all that you have to solder on so that should take you about oh maybe half an hour if you're really taking your time and working slowly because you haven't soldered much maybe an hour but it shouldn't be too bad um, but all the other parts are already on the board okay so that's that uh, let me switch back out of this okay so uh, so that's what we're going to be doing so the parts I didn't show you um, which maybe I'll just hold up uh, well maybe I'll use them I don't know. so there's three other things that go with it um, so one of them is this this little snap programmer uh, this is in a case I printed out these little cases um, but I'll show you one outside of the case So the snap actually looks like this. And here it is right here. Maybe I'll put it over here and let you see it for reals. Um, okay, we'll switch the camera again. Okay, so that's the snap and it and it would pro it would plug in right here. 
it actually plugs in um, kind of a funny way that this is an eight pin plug on the snap but only we only need five pins so it plugs in just fine to the six pin header and um, and then with that you can program your board uh, you can't power the board from this but you can program it and then this this USB micro plug over here on the other end connects to your laptop or desktop and um, and that's how you program the board you can program uh, I believe this snap can program almost any of the microchip uh, parts that they make uh, so it's really a handy little thing and for 10 bucks it's it's going to be a steal since it retails for 24 uh, all right so anyway um, but when it's in the case, there is, an, there is a little hole in the case. There's a little thing that shows you where it plugs in, and there's a little hole that lets you see the LED in here. Uh, so that kind of protects it, and this case just snaps together, and it actually works pretty well. And so I, I designed that in Fusion 360, and, we, and I 3D print these. Um, okay, so, uh, and we charge you 50 cents for this, kind of just to pay for the plastic. Okay, so that's that. Um, then the other things that go on, and I'm gonna I'm gonna move some of this stuff out of the way. So here here's a board that's kind of mostly put together, and uh, it, the 2102 dongle. What did I do with it? So here it is. This this um, this actually plugs in to this header over here like that, and uh, this particular one had the uh, had the the header uh, soldered on with a right angle header. That's what comes with it, but I don't ever use those. I always use a straight through header. And so normally it'll actually be sitting like this on the board. It'll, it'll look like that, it'll be flat. And then your uh, USB cable plugs in here. And this allows you to, 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 with the proper software running, allows you to talk to a desktop or a laptop. Then the other board, uh, let's see, the two other things, uh, two other things. One is this, uh, this analog board, which plugs in over here in this in this on the analog uh, receptor where the programmer jack was over here I, I guess it really was oriented like this and this this little board has this little uh, three pin black dude there that looks like a transistor that is a temperature sensor here is a potentiometer which you can turn and adjust and then here is a photoresistor that's sensitive to the brightness of light and you can feed the values from these three things in on these three analog pins and you get power and ground here to, to power them up and then your properly programmed chip can read these values and measure temperature, sense the light uh, amount of light, and, and you can set a threshold or use the pot to input an analog value if you want. And then, um, and then finally, we have a, a two line by 16 LCD display, and it has on the back of it this little daughter board that uh, allows us to talk to it using a, a two pin. Um, serial protocol called, called uh, integrated uh, inner integrated circuit uh, uh, protocol or I2C and uh, it connects with these four pins power ground and then there's two two wires associated with the uh, the uh, I2C protocol uh, SCL and S SDA yeah so anyway uh, and so you have to hook four DuPont wires uh, which I I don't know. Do I have any? Not super handy. Uh, no. So you hook up the wires. This is, I'll do two of them. You hook up wires and then you plug them into the board. Uh, like say this might be power and ground. So you plug it in power and ground here. And then you get your uh, I squared signal. I squared I2, I2C signal uh, comes off of RB4 and 6, uh, which are the. Uh, uh, the, the last and, nec and next and next to the last pins on this. And of course we they require pull-up resistors, but the pull-up resistors are already uh, on the board as surface mount parts. Okay, so so those are the things you get. Two line by 16 display, analog board, and dongle with the cables. You can check, I will sign these out to you for free. I just ask you that you turn them back in at the end of the semester. Um, if you want to buy them, they're pretty cheap. They're about $2 each or something like that, or maybe even a little less. Counting cables, maybe $2 each. And, um, and then the snap and, the, uh, and the, uh, the, the kit with all the parts on it, um, that's, that's, kind of, that's, that's what you get. All right, let me switch cameras. Okay. So that's what this says right here on the uh, course syllabus. 
And uh, so what I did for those that either cannot come to campus or refuse to come to campus, they can go on eBay and I'll sell them for $18 plus postage. I'll, I'll sell them all these things and they can own these things. But, uh, and then they don't have to send them back. So, and that actually makes it fairly straightforward. I can print out the, the shipping label. I can pay micro, I can pay eBay for the postage and, uh, and put it in a little envelope, slap the label on it. The postage is already on there and I can just drop it in the mail and you'll get it hopefully in a few days and hopefully I'll get them sent out sometime this week. The only problem is I want to send everything at once and right now I only have, I only have a handful of snaps so I only put nine up on, the, on, on eBay. When I find out from the parts band exactly how many snaps I have left, then I, if there are more snaps, I can send a few more out there. I think there were maybe, maybe 10 or 15 snaps. I don't know. There may not be that many. I personally have in my hands four of them, so I'm going to mail those out in the morning. And the other um, five, I'm hoping to get snaps from the parts bin soon, like maybe tomorrow. So hopefully in a day or so, I'll have those sent out. For everybody else, uh, microchip's going to come through with either a big discount or maybe they'll give me some free ones or whatever so so it'll drop the cost significantly for them um, and so once we find out what that's going to look like uh, then I'll have hopefully snaps enough for everybody uh, that's the plan uh, but I'm kind of hostage to the speed at which microchips work in here uh, even though I've been working on it since last January um, worst case I just go out and buy a uh, hundred snaps uh, at $24 a piece for $2,400 and then sell them to you for 10 bucks. But I just soon not take that big loss. Uh, so I don't mind taking a little bit of a hit, but uh, a big hit is painful. So we'll see. Hopefully we'll get that going. Worst case, I'll just do that and, and I'll take the hit. But I'm counting on microchip to come through. They promised they'd have it another couple weeks. So we'll see. All right. Um, the, the, this analog header made those myself. We printed out, we designed the printed circuit board. We sent it out, got it made. And then I saw I bought all the parts and soldered them on, and uh, and I I I really don't want to sell you one of these. Uh, I just like you to use it for the semester and give it back so I can use it next semester. The two line by sixteen display I bought a bunch of those. I, I don't want to have to replenish it every semester. But if you really really want to buy one, just let me know. I'll be happy to sell it to you for probably two bucks or two fifty. I forget it. it it's about what it costs. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it was four dollars. I don't have to look. I don't remember. But I, I bought like a hundred of them or something, so they they were fairly inexpensive. Uh, and then the the UART I have tons of those, and they're they're about a dollar, a do, right at a dollar maybe or maybe just a hair more. And then uh, the uh, USB micro, uh, the micro USB to regular USB cables are they're about a dollar a piece or two dollars a piece or something like that. And of course you need about two of them, one for the snap and one for the the, the dongle. All right, so that's everything. So let me just say this one more time. So I want everybody to have uh, the hardware to do this course. For those of you who are willing and can come by one, once or twice to pick parts up, I would really appreciate it if you do that. Uh, and I'll, it'll be cheaper for you. I'll charge you four bucks for the board, ten for the programmer. That's all you have to do. Maybe a dollar for the for the two cases, the plastic cases, for the snap and the Viva board. Uh, I don't have an example of the tray for the board, I don't think. But anyway, uh, it just protects the bottom of the board so you won't short it out or set it down in water. Um, the uh, so so for 15 bucks max, you 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 got this, and then you can sign out the rest of the stuff and use it all semester. And if for some reason you really want to buy it later on, just let me know and I give me two bucks or. Or, or you can even just keep it. But I, I would like to get it back because it's just a hassle to, to have to do a bunch of buying right before each semester. Okay, for those of you who, who absolutely cannot bring yourself to come by and pick it up for various reasons, then I will, uh, I will put some more kits on eBay and you can order it for $18 uh, plus shipping. So it'll be about 23 bucks. I really only want people that absolutely cannot pick it up to do that. Um, if you if you just want all the parts to keep, I'd rather have you come by and pick them up and 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 just pay me for them later in the semester or whatever. Uh, 
so it, and it will still be less than the than the twenty three dollars I think um, should be cheaper because I'll I'll probably charge it two two and two so um, so anyway so that's the deal so if you can come by and pick them up please do if you absolutely cannot uh, let me know and I'll I'll put that many more I'll send out an email when I put some more on eBay once I once I have the snaps because I I have to send it all out at once and I don't want to make eBay mad and not uh, not ship the product that's been paid for in a timely manner because then I get a bad bad you know bad rating or whatever. Okay, hopefully if you have questions about that, uh, we'll do a Zoom help session later in the week, or, or I'll see you in lab on Friday for those that come in and we, and you can ask questions. We can talk about. Um, okay, so. All the labs will EB020422. Uh, EB There'll be room for 14 students. The laboratory will open on Friday morning for Micro 1 at 10 a.m. You're assigned to either 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, or 3. Or well, maybe the last one's 2. We'll keep the lab open until 3. Depending on how it goes, if you come and there's more than 14 students, you'll have to wait till somebody leaves. Uh, we can only have 14 students at a time in there, plus the TA and maybe myself. So, so that's kind of the plan. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you'll kind of space yourselves out throughout the day. Every one of you is now assigned to a different, you know, to a different lab group. Uh, so you can kind of try and come in later. Uh, if everybody comes at 10, I'm sure it'll be crowded. But if some come at 10, some come at 11, some come at 12, some come at 1, some come at 2. Um, then it, we probably can make it work. It most labs won't take more than an hour, so so many of you will, will could get in and out very quickly. But you don't have to come to lab. You can do all the work at home. The first order of business is going to be to solder your board, and we will have some solder kits available uh, in uh, the lab on Friday this Friday. Usually, and when we're normally not dealing with COVID, the uh, um, the HKN uh, honorary does solder workshops. I don't know. They haven't said anything to me about doing that, I, and I don't know if that's going to happen. So we'll have five solder kits available on uh, in lab, and you can use those. I would encourage some of you just to go ahead and order uh, a solder kit from uh, off of eBay or um, Amazon because they're only about twenty-five bucks for a fairly nice one. You want to get one where you can control the temperature. And where you can change the tips, and and one that's not too bad. Uh, maybe I'll pop on here and show you. Uh, if we go on, um, if we go on, uh, let's go on Amazon. So if you go on Amazon and I do solder station, so. There's all sorts of stuff, and you can see some of these are kind of pricey. Uh, here's a pretty fancy one for 45 bucks, but uh, but here's one. Well, this is 38 dollars. I've used one of these for many, many, many years. The tips are replaceable. There's a little set screw. You loosen it, you pop it out, pop in a new one, and you can buy these tips uh, online very easily. This is a Weller, and the tips are widely available for the WLC 100. So uh, so this is a good one. But some of these others are very nice too. Uh, there's some pretty good ones. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, so you, you'll find some things. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, well, there's a solder mat for 14 bucks. You don't really have to have that. Um, okay, well, it looks like... Yeah, I don't see. Okay, here... Well, no. So, yeah. So here's, here's one that's a little fancier for 48 Here's another one that's a little fancier for 45. All those have the ability to change tips and set the temperature. Here's one for 13. Um, this may not allow you to change the temperature. Uh, oh, it, extra solder tip. So it does. So you. So this would actually. This is actually not too bad. Uh, it may not allow you to change. Yeah, you can't change the temperature on this one. So that's one problem. Um, all right. Well, anyway. So you can look. Uh, you don't have to buy one. We will um, we'll definitely provide uh, some ones to check out. You can also check them out and take them home and turn them back in the next day. Uh, because our support staff's not going to, I don't know, 
they're only coming in uh, one day a week uh, for a few hours and then working up in the engineering office. So I, I don't know how that's going to work, but normally they check it out. But uh, we'll, we'll work something out for those that need to check them out overnight. We usually have you just leave your ID card and then you pick it, bring it back in and get your car back the next day. But in any event, um, so we do want you to do the solder. Okay, and uh, we'll start working on that in lab on Friday. My goal is to get everybody's board soldered up for the end of next week. But if not, you know, we can slide it probably another week and still catch up. All right. So here, here's, here is the, um, here's the uh, let's see, I didn't finish uh, all of the, uh, no, sorry. So let's just go through the rest of the uh, syllabus a little bit real quickly, uh, even though it's 32 pages. Um, so only have to wear your mask, 14 students at a time, six feet distancing as much as we possibly can. Um, the, uh, I will try and do videos uh, for the labs, for some of the labs where it's a little more complicated, uh, but there are lab reports that will guide you through it. I'm still, uh, I pretty much update these every semester and I've got some more cleaning up to do on the ones for this semester. There are no required attendance, but when you finish your lab, if you're in lab, you can just show it to the TA and get credit. If you're not in lab, what I'd like you to do is to do a short little video and send that short video to the TA. Uh, so he can see that your board did what it was supposed to do and he'll sign off. Probably the ideal thing would be to put your ID card into the video so we know it's really your video and not, not your buddy's video. Um, uh, so here's a bunch of things on the COVID considerations, uh, some stuff on disability services, uh, some stuff on all sorts of things. But here's my contact information. It's also on Blackboard here if you scroll down. Here it is there as well, my home address, uh, my cell phone, and my, um, uh, well, I thought, oh yeah, and then paul.martin at utsa.edu. Then this is the office hours Zoom. I'm going to have office, had office hours today, 12 to 1. I'll do it again next Monday, 12 to 1, and so forth. These office hours are for everybody in all three of my courses and my independent study students. So. It might be crowded. I will have a special Zoom help session pretty much every week uh, for my for my for each course, and so you'll have your own Zoom session for help later in the week. Um, so you can come then. You can come on any of the office hours. Um, it was crowded today. It probably will be next week, but then after that, I, it'll probably lean out, and then you can come and I'll probably uh, talk. If you want to talk some other time, you can send me an email, and we'll set up a private meeting some other time, and that's fine too. Okay. Um, so uh, my office is BSE 1.538 but I'm not at this point setting up a bunch of in-person face-to-face office hours but if you want to come face-to-face -face, uh, I will meet with you you just need to email me and we'll set that up to contact me do not call me on the telephone because I probably won't answer because I get a lot of sales calls text me uh, if it's emergency text me if it's not email me I check the email at least every day, sometimes multiple times a day, but I don't necessarily check it on weekends. So if you email me late Friday evening, I may not see it till late Monday evening. I may give you a call first thing Tuesday or whatever. So it could be as that much time, but normally, uh, normally 24 hours of the working uh, of the five-day work week, uh, I will, you know, I will, I will reply. Um, that is my office number if I happen to be in. Uh, I will be in and out a fair amount. Okay, um, so do not use the send mail function on Blackboard or the course Q and A form. I won't. I don't really monitor those. There's just too many students to keep up with multiple, multiple ways. So I prefer email and text messages. Uh, text messages for kind of pseudo emergencies. Email for regular stuff. Remember, according to the university. Uh, it's a FERPA violation to talk about grades on email. So if we need to talk about grades, I'll, we'll have to talk about it on the cell phone. I think that's the only way it's private enough. Um, apparently you can also use, there's secure email within Blackboard, but I, I, I haven't ever used that. Um, okay, so there is no text for this course. Uh, you have to have taken logic design with a C or better. 
and you should have had an uh, uh, intro course of C++. Um, here's some course objectives, topics covered. Uh, we will have two 70-minute video, uh, videos each week to represent the lectures. You can watch them anytime, and there's a, be a quiz. Typically, most of them will have a quiz afterwards. You have to do the quiz and watch the videos. The video links will, will stay up forever, but the quiz will only be available until Saturday. So whatever day the quiz is put up, like Tuesday or Thursday, but Saturday at midnight, the quiz will go away. So if you haven't done the quiz by Saturday at midnight, it's going to cost you uh, uh, maybe 0.2, uh, 0 0.2 course points. Um, there will be an hour lab session per week. You're all assigned to one on Friday, but we don't run that specifically for that 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 time block you're assigned to we run the whole thing from 10 to 3 and you can come and go as you wish as long as there's no more than 14 people in the room at one time because of covid all right um so we're going to have homework quizzes a midterm at least one maybe two maybe a practicum we'll see if we can get that to happen a final exam and a final project and at least 10 labs you must complete the final project and nine of the ten labs to get a grade. If you uh, if you don't, um, sorry, let me put my video back up. If you don't at least do uh, nine of the ten projects or the final project, you will get an incomplete. Now, you you may think that sounds unfair, but what you would normally earn as a course grade would be an F because these count a fair amount of your grade. So instead of giving you an F, I give you an incomplete. And then you have one year to make up the missed work. And if you make it up, then I just put that into the grade, uh, the grade uh, spreadsheet and your grade pops out. Whatever it would have been if you'd done it in a timely manner, you will get that same grade. You don't have to register or pay tuition again, but if you don't do it within 12 months, then your incomplete converts to an F. This is what the incomplete was really supposed to be used for was somebody that has an automobile accident, they're in the hospital three weeks, and then they can't walk for a couple weeks. Um, and it's to kind of cut them slack and let them finish the course later on. But so I'm sort of a this is sort of a bastardized use, but it's for your benefit. And uh, so if you complain to the university, they they'll probably prevent me from doing it, which will screw students. Because otherwise, you just get an F, and then you have to take the course over, pay tuition again, and if you're taking it for the third time, average your grades. So that's that kind of sucks, right? So it's much better. To do the incomplete and as long as nobody complains and the university doesn't push back that's what i'll do when the university says i can't do that then i'll quit um, so um, so hopefully this will work i prefer nobody gets an incomplete i'd like everybody to do your final project and at least nine of the ten labs you should do all ten missing one will hurt you a little bit so don't do it uh, this is of course if you do the labs and the final exam uh I, sorry if you do the labs and the final project you will be in pretty good shape. Uh, so you don't really have to worry too much. Uh, you, you're almost guaranteed to get a B if you do all the work. Uh, and if you do well on the exams, you'll get an A. That's kind of the divider. Uh, if you do well on the exams, you'll get an A. If you do OK or crappy on the exams, but you do everything else, you'll get a B. Uh, so, so the exams are kind of the A, B discriminator, really. Turn in your homework. That'll hurt you. Uh, the post. Video quizzes will hurt you if you if you don't do most of them. All you have to do is get half the questions right on the quizzes, and you get full credit. Each quiz counts 0.2%. Uh, uh, so you hear the hear the objectives. Uh, there is no required test textbook. We're going to use the data sheet for the PIC 16F 1829, and uh, there's a link on Blackboard. But you can just Google PIC 16F 1829 data sheet, and it'll come right up. You should go ahead and download that download that and have that on your uh, PC. We may or may not get around to using the Freedom Board at the end of the course. It, it just, in this difficult COVID time, it just adds in a bunch more hassle, so we may not. Uh, if you feel like you need to get a book, then you can go on Amazon and look for a book, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pick 16 Programming. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, but n none of them are really essential, and most of them are confusing in some ways. So I, I feel like if you come to if you do all the videos and you, you get out of lecture, you should get out enough to, to be to do this really well. That having been said, I don't know. We'll see. Um, this is the first time I've taught the whole course as an online course. Uh, 
when you do our Zoom help sessions, uh, we're going to be debugging code. It really how I really want to see your smiling face. Please get a working webcam or use or make sure you get a laptop with a working camera so I, so you can do your video. Uh, you can keep your mic muted unless you're talking, but uh, but show your video so so I can see what people are. And then if you raise your hand or nod your head, it kind of helps with a, a sense of community. And then uh, we will definitely be debugging code in the Zoom help sessions, especially when you're doing your projects, especially for some of the labs. So uh, so it'll really help me to see you. And then a, little, a lot of times what we'll do is you can show your code on on your uh, main screen and then you can have your video on your iPhone as well and you can use that video on the iPhone to let me see your project board while we're also debugging your code uh, kind of gives us a two screen option so uh, so make sure you have video access so we can see your smiling lovey face okay um, so there's a bunch of more other helpful stuff uh, and you can get help from the university if you can't log on. If you need a laptop, uh, you can sign those out. They've got those available. Uh, and here's the grading scheme. So we'll have post video quizzes. There'll be 25 or 35 of them. They cost 0.2 each. And so if you get 25, that's five points. If you get 35, then you'll have 7.5 points. So you can get extra points from your video quizzes. All you gotta do is get half the questions right, you get full credit. Doesn't help you to, to get them all right, just all you need is half of them right, you'll get full credit. Final project, one of those, 20 points. Labs, 10 of those, 2.5 each for 25 points. Homework, 1.5 points, eight of those for 12 points. Midterm exams, two of them at seven points apiece for 14 points, and one final for 24 points. I may, uh, that's what it says right now, I may change that as we go through the semester and shrink this and add a few more points uh, into I don't know, maybe a point or two in homework and a point or two in post-video quizzes. We'll see. I don't know, but probably not. Well, I may leave it just like it is. But if I change it, I'll change it way before you get to the final exam time. Um, okay, I don't do it pluses and minuses, just A, B, C, D, F. All right. Um, quizzes. Okay, so after every lecture will be posted when it should be given. So 11 o'clock on Tuesday, by 11, I'll post it. I'll probably post it tonight when I finish this. By 11 on Thursday, uh, I'll post it by 11 on Thursday. And then you can do the quiz whenever. They'll be available when I post the videos. Uh, you should definitely look at the lecture first so you got some chance of getting the questions right. But if you, if you miss all the questions, um, then, well, you won't get credit. But if you get at least half of them right, you'll get full credit. But you have to do the quiz by midnight Saturday of the week that the lecture occurred. The lectures will always stay on, uh, the links will stay on Blackboard, the lectures will stay on YouTube, but the quizzes will go away midnight Saturday. I will not bring them back. If you do not do it the week that they're up, you've missed them and you won't get a chance to redo them. If you have a, if you were, you know, shot by the police and you're in the hospital and then you get out, uh, I will definitely cut you some slack. I'll probably give you an incomplete and then you can make it up later. But, uh, but other than that, I expect you to do the work in the week it's due. Same for homework. If you turn the homework in, uh, right now the homework due dates are in the syllabus and they're correct, but the, the links in Blackboard have not been updated yet to reflect the correct due date. I will fix that uh, in another day or so. Don't let that panic you. But just keep in mind, you, if you don't turn them in by midnight on the day they're due, uh, 1159 actually then you get half off so if you only have 80 percent of the homework done go ahead and turn it in turn it in on time and if you miss a problem or two you'll still be at 50 percent if on the other hand you wait till two or three days later and then you turn it in now you did a hundred percent of it but but you only get 50 percent credit so if you miss one question it won't count so uh so you, it's always in your interest to turn it in on time even if you don't have it all done um and you only need to get 50% on the homework to get full credit. 50% on the post video quiz to get full credit. Okay, we'll try and get a discussion board rolling, but I don't know how that's going to work. I, I haven't ever used it before, but it's my it's my hope. Um, there, this is I meant to delete this. There won't be a group presentation. There will be a final project, and I'll modify that to say say this. 
Uh, okay, everything should be done 11.59 on the day, p.m. on the day it's due. Uh, and your labs, your labs, most of the labs do have a little turn-in sheet. Uh, there's a little bit of grace on the labs, but there will be a date on the syllabus, I think it's already on there, where no more makeup labs will be allowed. So that's the point where you know you're going to get an incomplete if you're missing more than one lab. You're done. Uh, and the reason for that is, if I didn't do that, I would have, you know, 50 students trying to turn in five, you know, trying to get in and do five labs in the last week of class, which is terrible. That's the worst time in the world to be doing it because you're also trying to get your final project done. Final projects. Uh, at this point, I'll probably just have you do a video with, uh, and I'll, I'll let you do them as a team with one, two, or three people. Uh, so you can do it by yourself. You can do it with two people if you are comfortable with that, or three people max, no more than three. And you'll have to turn in a proposal for what you're going to do. We'll talk at length about the various things you can do. I have lots and lots and lots of uh, added on uh, electronic stuff you can add on, uh, GPS modules, uh, GMRS modules so you can talk to cell towers, um, uh, temperature sensors, uh, well, other temperature sensors, um, I don't know, um, uh, OLED displays, um, I don't know, there's a whole litany. I, this, there, I probably have 50 different things you can hook in. Or you can just use your board as it is with no real additional added stuff. Uh, you can use your four touch buttons uh, and you can use those to do a cipher lock. You can use those to do a game. Uh, you can you can do all sorts of things and people have done lots of very interesting things we will give hopefully we'll be able to give awards this semester I did I we d didn't really do it last semester because it was just too hard with the COVID stuff it may be too hard this semester but if it's not we'll try and do it normally we have a uh, presentation everybody presents their final project in the uh, BSE atrium on the same day we set up uh, 36 tables and just let students display and then I have faculty go through and judge, and we pick uh, first place, second place, third place, hundred dollars to first place, fifty to second, twenty-five to third. So, uh, so there is some chance to make a little money. I don't know if we'll be able to do that this semester. Uh, you know, who knows? If everybody gets vaccinated, maybe we will, or maybe we can, maybe we can do it with social distancing somehow. I don't know. We'll see. Um, all right, quality work. When you turn in your homework or you turn in things. Turn them in as dot .docs or PDFs. If you scan it, you get a, a JPEG, paste the JPEG into a dot .doc or a PDF, and then submit it. Clean up your handwriting so it's readable. Better yet, type it in. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, we talked about late work, incompletes. I talked about incompletes. Uh, and that's where I say two or more labs or your final project will result in an incomplete. Again, uh, I I don't you know don't give me any pushback against this. This is this is in your interest, and you know because the option is just to get an F. If you don't do the final project, that's twenty five percent of your grade. That's you're going to get an F. I mean, how how are you going to get a decent grade with twenty five percent missing? Um, all you'd have to do is lose a few other points somewhere else, and you're already under, you're down in the 60s easily. Um, so, uh, so this is to help you. This is to help you, you know, not have to pay for the course again and take the whole thing over. Uh, so, uh, you know, so this is this is you know, in general, this is a really good thing. Uh, all right. Uh, everybody, be nice. Uh, all right, and there's tech support. You can click on these links and get help um, for disabilities. Help, additional assistance. Help. Um, tutoring services are available. Lots of them. Academic co success coaching. Uh, there's lots of uh, there's lots of help out there, and we have within the College of Engineering we have a student success center. It's very well run and it's very and it works well. Take advantage of it. Um, uh, counseling services. If you're, le for the love of God, let me know if you're really getting depressed and you're thinking about harming yourself. Reach out, get help. Do not do anything crazy. Uh, there's free counseling. 
uh, university provides it, and it, it's pretty good. I've known students that have gone and gotten help, and it's helped them. So uh, one of my students was suicidal, and he saw the counselor, and they really had it. They helped him, and he, he, he's doing great today, and he's not, uh, he didn't kill himself. Otherwise, he might, might, might not be here. So don't let that happen. Um, all right. You know I'm a medical doctor, so if you have health issues, you can go to the Student Health Center. You can call me up and get a free consult. Um, all right, um, all sorts of student help. Uh, nobody should feel uh, picked on. Uh, I love every one of you, whether you're, no matter what color or gender you are. I may be a little partial to the women because I was a gynecologist, but, uh, but I love all my students. And uh, we, if there's any inappropriate behavior, let me know, we will report it. We don't want anybody being harassed, persecuted, sexually harassed. Um, we don't want anything bad happening. Everybody should be treated with respect. And I promise I will treat you with respect. Um, occasionally I may make a joke, but if you feel offended by it, for the love of God, let me know, and I won't ever do it again. But I, I try not to do anything really too bad. Um, nor do I try and pick on anybody who I already know wouldn't be able to, to hack it. And I'm trying not to do it at all. So I don't do it much anyway. I, I, I really do love you guys, and, and I love all of you. And if you're struggling, uh, I want to help you. I want everybody to pass this course with at least a B. That's my goal, and I don't have any requirement to give F's or D's or C's. Uh, I could give everybody an A if you do the work and earn it. Be happy to. So just don't cheat on exams. Um, I will. I am going to do some things to make it hard for you to cheat, so I would appreciate you not cheating. But if you do try and heat, you'll, you'll probably find it will be difficult. I may even have different different exams with different questions so that uh, you'll find that it'll really it'll be difficult to cheat. Plus we will do the exams where you uh, can't back up, the questions are randomized, the answers are randomized, and you have not a tight time limit but enough of a time limit that you can't uh, you know be driving all over San Antonio. It's basically all open book. You can consult the internet. Uh, so and the questions will be new. I don't repeat things from previous semesters. Similar, but different. So you're not gonna get any help from Chegg on the exams. Um, okay. Yeah, sexual harassment. Don't do it. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see, I think that's it. Um, we, we respect everybody from every background. And um, we're very serious about that. And we especially want to, for those that really came from, you know, economically disadvantaged situations or lousy failing high schools, you know, that's, we want to help you. Uh, we want you to succeed. Every one of you. Okay. And I want you, not only that, but I want you to enjoy it. And for the smart kids, I, I, want, to, I want to push you and challenge you uh, so that you feel like you got pushed and challenged. So uh, for, the, for somebody who's maybe struggling because of just bad preparation, uh, you know, that's fine. We will get you through this and we'll get you to get a B at least, if not an A. So everybody's going to going to succeed unless you just decide you're going to fail. And don't do that because there's no reason to. All right, we need engineers. We've got to compete with the rest of the world. We need smart engineers. Okay, so here we are uh, today, 825. Uh, I'm going to hopefully I pretty much burn through my time, but I, I've got another 15 minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to, Transition out of this and cover start start on the lecture part. Oh, let's see. I think I've covered everything. So um, let me just look at Blackboard here real quick. So if you scroll down here, here's what here's where you come in. That's the course content page. Alex Abera is our uh, is our uh, TA. Alex is a good buddy. When Alex was a junior in high school at uh, at uh, oh. Um, forget the name of the high school anyway he was my he he was my I was his ment mentor and so I've known him since he was a junior in high school and then he did a year at uh, at uh, in Arizona State I think uh, or somewhere New Mexico or Arizona came back here after a semester and he and he, then he's graduated in June he's working on his master's degree now he's a smart kid very sincere hard-working kid he, he was a first-gen graduate and uh, his dad actually works as a maintenance guy at UTSA. Um, he's a he's a good kid, 
and uh, he will help you. He's very sincere and smart. So he'll be a really great TA, and I think you'll really enjoy. If you don't already know him, you'll enjoy getting to know him. Um, these are the Zoom. This is the Zoom link for the help for the for the office hours, and these are all the dates. So every Monday at one at uh, noon to one. Um, again, uh, contact information. Uh, Ryan Savidra has graduated, but he's going to help us. Uh, and he's going to come into Zoom sessions, and we may do breakout rooms so he can de help students debug code in one room while I'm helping in another, maybe. We'll see. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But he's going to help me, and that, that's really wonderful. He's just volunteering his time. He's working at, I think he's working at, I can't remember, maybe Southwest Research Institute? I don't know. But anyway, he's a smart kid, and he just he just loves to help because he felt like he got a lot of micro one, and he wants to give you a good experience, too. All right. Syllabus, labs. Uh, if we click on labs, you can see there's a bunch of labs uh, right here. So lab zero is build the board. There's an assembly guide. There's a bunch of stuff. Um, and so there's a movie. So uh, take advantage of this. It'll help you. You should look at this before you come to lab trying to build your board. Um, and I'll, I'll, on Thursday, I'll, I will sh do a little demo, a soldering demonstration. That hopefully will help you. All right. <clears throat> So lab one is going to be blink the LED. Oh, oh, I didn't say this. We're going to do it in assembly language. So lab one is blink the LED with a with a software loop. Lab two, we're going to use the timer module built into the chip. We'll set the timer module up to provide the delay for the blink. And three, we'll use interrupts and we'll we'll blink two different LEDs, um, uh, one with the interrupt and one with a timing loop. And the interrupt will be driven by the uh, one of the timer modules. In lab four. We will uh, we will do the same thing, but we'll do it in C. Now, last semester we skipped this lab, and uh, it kind of caused a lot of problems, so we won't skip it this time. So the first three labs we will do in assembly language, and then we'll switch to C. Uh, the reason I do that is uh, I I think it's very important for you to learn assembly language, because if you learn assembly language, uh, you automatically learn how the computer works. And I think that's very important for engineers that are doing embedded design. So I really want you to do that. So uh, so you'll learn assembly language. And uh, I took me a long time to figure out how to teach this so students learned it, but I figured it out and you will learn it. So not to worry. All right, uh, and then we have, uh, then we have uh, pulse width modulation so that we can uh, we'll use a potentiometer and PWM and we're going to dim uh, we're going to dim an LED using PWM and you're going to do that with the pot. Uh, then we're going to do touch sensing and we're going to use our dongle and send information uh, well actually we're going to do a we're going we're going to fade the LED and assembler here and let's see no I guess we do it here. So I guess we're going to do it in C. Yeah, we're going to do it in C. Here we're going to do we're going to use our touch our touch buttons, and uh, we're going to also use our dongle and send send uh, information to the uh, uh, to your laptop or desktop uh, uh, terminal window. There are a whole bunch of programs that will run terminal windows. We use Putty, but there's lots available. And then here we're going to use our our little adapter board, the one that I showed you earlier. Uh, this one right here. Uh, with the uh, with the pot and the temperature sensor and the photoresistor on it, and um, you'll use the you'll set the use the pot to set thresholds to turn off LEDs with the uh, with the temperature sensor and with the photoresistor. You obviously have to have different thresholds for each. Um, then we'll do a um, we'll also use the internal temperature sensor as part of that lab uh, and. Yeah. We'll also use, I think that was it. Yeah, okay. Then we'll also do a sleep lab. We'll, we'll show you how to put the, the processor to sleep. We'll show you how to use the watchdog timer. Uh, and uh, we'll show how sleep, how sleep really sh saves a lot of power. Um, then we'll set up uh, some uh, BJTs, some uh, bipolar junction transistors, and we'll show you how to how to switch external devices with a couple of BJ with a BJ with a single BJT. We'll talk about how to use those, and you can use your uh, uh, Viva board to turn to turn the switch on and off. 
And then we'll also show you your onboard two transistor switch that's built into your Viva board and we'll show you how to use that too. And then, uh, then we're going to hook up your 2 by 16 LCD display and we're going to drive that with uh, we're going to drive that with your I squared C line. Uh, and that will be probably the last lab. Uh, I might add one more lab or depending we may we may switch to the KL25Z Freedom Board and have you do a demonstration lab with that. We'll just have to see how big of a hassle it's going to be with with um, still messing with COVID. Uh, so we'll see. We may do that. We may not. Um, okay, that's that. Uh, and then I wanted to show a couple more things on the blackboard. I guess I'm really burning through. Um, all right. Uh, so here's here's the homework list. That lists all the homework you need to do, and uh, this is where you turn it in. Now, if you click on this, you'll notice that I think all these are grayed out for you. You can't even see them, uh, but I will I will fix the dates. I'll go in here and set the dates so that the dates are right, and then you will be able to see these links, and you'll be able to turn your homework in. Right now, they are not visible. Don't let that freak you out. Okay, and then finally, uh, let's see. Uh, we will, let's see, I thought... I thought I had the video, but well, I guess I won't. I'll also put up here a video file, and it will say, maybe I'll just do that right now. It will say, um, content folder. It'll be, yeah, YouTube uh, video. Well, I'm going to say micro one. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So we'll have this one, and uh, it goes all the way down to the bottom. And there's a lot of things grayed out you can't see, but uh, I'll slowly get it back up to the top here. And I will put all the all the YouTube links in this folder, not the videos, but the YouTube links, because you can't upload videos anymore. Um, Okay, and I'll put these right underneath the homework, maybe before the homework. And then underneath this, I'll also put a folder where your post video quizzes will be. So you have a folder for the video links to the YouTube. You have a folder right underneath this for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the, the post video quiz. And um, again, usually, usually four or five, well, usually, usually an even number of questions. So four or six questions, or maybe 10, maybe eight, but usually at least four, and no more than 10. And uh, you have to get half of them right to get full credit. You will have probably 15 minutes to do the questions. And, uh, and uh, so, um, you know, watch the video and then do the quiz. You have until Saturday night at midnight to get the quizzes done for that week's lectures. At midnight, they go away. and unless you have a really, really, really great reason, uh, like you're in the hospital at the ICU, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any exceptions because it's just a hassle to do that. Uh, and, and it doesn't help you to take the quiz later on. It's, you should do it right after you watch the video. So it's, okay. And I think that's, that's pretty much it. When it gets time to talk about final projects, we'll talk about that. Uh, and okay, so I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do some slides. Okay, so uh, let me bring in my face again here. Okay, so um, so you can see well. So dear algebra, please stop asking us to find your x. She's never coming back, and don't ask why. All right. Uh, so, okay, a little attempt at humor. All right, we've covered most of this stuff already. Uh, the Viva part's four bucks. The snap's going to be ten. The plastic covers and the tray are another fifty cents each. So about fifteen bucks. Uh, it's good if you have some Dupont wires. Uh, male to female are the best kind to have. You might need a few male to males, but basically male to female mostly. Um, if you're going to put something on a whiteboard, you need male to males. If you're going to put it on a, if you're going to connect to a to a little daughter board, 
uh, that's got pins on it, then you need the male to female. Uh, because your, your Viva board has mostly female connections that you need to use. Um, so you're going to sign out the CR2102 dongle, the 2x16 LCD display, and the uh, custom analog board with the temp, photoresist, and pot on it. And then you're going to buy these other two things, the, the Viva kit and the snap. And that's all you need for the whole course, unless you uh, need something else for your final project, in which case I have most of everything, and you can come by and pick it up from my office. On you know, Just make an arrangement. We'll do that. Uh, uh, we'll see. Okay. Uh, going crazy here. Um, so any other parts that you need, I'll provide. Uh, and if you have something really special you want to do, I'll, I'll probably just order the parts for you if you want. Because uh, it's, it's something really interesting. I'll, I'll probably order, order one for you to work with and order a few for me to have on hand for next year. Um, okay. Um, so this first week, we want to get our pick boards done. The, the whole key to learning microprocessors is it's a hands-on hands world. You need to program that sucker up and connect it to stuff and see it work. And that's the only way to learn this. Um, so we'll, we'll work on that. Um, we're going to talk about the programmer's model, how the chip is organized, how its memory is organized. We'll talk about the instruction set. We'll talk about a whole bunch of things. We'll talk about not just the, the firmware issues, but we'll also talk about hardware issues. Um, we'll talk about how to interface peripheral models, uh, how to use peripheral modules to connect to real-world things. We'll talk about how to have off-chip stuff that we're going to connect to the chip because the chip doesn't have a peripheral module for everything you want to do, but it does have a lot of them. It has more than you would think. It's quite amazing. And we'll talk about our, our uh, supporting tools to, uh, to do the development. We'll talk about your integrated development environment. We'll talk about our... Uh, programmer debugger. We're, we'll, we'll talk about the debugging features in your integrated development environment. Um, and we are going to learn how to program in assembly and in C or C++. They're kind of equivalent for this. We don't do a... There's these, the code for these things is generally not so complicated that you're dealing with the uniquely C++ features like inheritance and some other things. Um, so, uh, so it's mostly C, but it, in general you, you, you can run C++ on it. Um, Okay, um, so philosophy of microprocessors. Up till now, your relationship with computers has largely been a black box relationship. You, you load up software, you, you hit run, and the software runs, you learn how to use the software, and that's about it. Uh, so, but now you're going you're gonna to look down into the guts of the machine, and you're going to see how instructions are actually executed, where they're stored, and how the, how the processor uh, does this. We're not going to do a course in compiler des in, uh, in, uh, uh, in computer design or processor design, uh, but we are going to get down into the weeds to some extent. And part of this is because just learning assembly language is going to force you to see how the computer actually does its things. Now, even below that level of abstraction, there's stuff below there that's also going on that we're not going to look at. Uh, but uh, a lot of that stuff is proprietary and microchip doesn't even publish or tell you about it so you, you don't really know it and there's generally no way to find out unless you do it in you know some kind of an industrial espionage or work for microchip we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between a low level and a high level language and and you'll see in most microprocessors we don't use an operating system although they do exist even for this micro there's some you could use but realistically it it, this micro doesn't have the bells and whistles to make an OS useful. So normally we wouldn't do it. Uh, the only reason uh, for an OS on an embedded processor is typically to do what's called uh, a real-time operating system, or RTOS. And we use that mostly just to have uh, a referee apportion resources to several different applications that might find themselves in competition. And rather than let them, uh, rather than put the code in the applications to, to deconflict their use of the same resources, we create a little RTOS to do it for us. And they're usually pretty pretty lightweight, a very uh, very small code footprint in the uh, in the um, in the memory. Um, not at all, nothing like fatware that Windows is, for instance. Um, and one I want you to finish this course where you you believe that you understand 
the sort of the steps and the approach and and uh, a lot of the underlying facts about how a processor works and how you would choose one and apply one to a given problem and how to interface it and how to write uh, some basic code and some things you would have to understand to make your code work. Um, so again, uh, I think I covered all this already. So once you understand a little bit about how microcomputers have come to be, uh, the basic architecture, uh, how an instruction is processed, what the basic peripheral functions that are provided on almost all micros, uh, and then some of the fancy ones that are provided on some, uh, and then some of the basic issues of embedded design, how you can serve power, how, how you would choose the right chip, uh, how, you know, how, you, uh, how you make them fail-proof, things like that. And then we'll do a lot of practical experience stuff where we actually, uh, where we, where we actually you solder on the parts on your board and finish it up, and you see how that board's put together, where you learn uh, how your integrated development environment works and how you can write code and assembly and see to make your uh, chip do what it's supposed to do. And uh, we might look at the advanced scale 25Z, or we might not. We'll see how, how, we have, how that works out. So uh, here's just some of the evolution of some of the digital designs. Uh, and, you know, I, I'll just finish with this slide. Uh, when I first started programming computers, I started in 1963. I took a graduate course as a uh, sophomore in high school and uh, uh, at our local college because the local college was the only computer in town besides one at a, at a industry called Columbia Records Club. I think it still exists. Um, uh, the computer I used at that college was an IBM 1620. It had, get this, 2K of memory. 2K. Not 2 meg, not 2 gig, 2K. And uh, it didn't have an operating system, didn't have a disk, because they, they really had not quite yet been invented at that point. It, was, it ran on vacuum tubes and uh, magnetic cores. It uh, took up an entire room. And when they installed the computer at the college, the uh, public utility company had to come in and install a special three-phase three power drop to provide enough electricity to run the thing. And the room needed some serious air conditioning to dissipate the heat that all the vacuum tubes generated. Um, anyway, so uh, all the information went into and out of that computer uh, basically on punch cards. You had switches on the front panel where you could put, where you could click in a byte if you needed to. And our output was punch cards. Or we could, we could, it had a an IBM electric typewriter on the desk, not a Selectric, a pre-Selectric IBM electric typewriter. And uh, Selectrics are even gone now. But, um, and you can see, here's kind of where we went from big and small. Uh, and uh, when we went from uh, things like microprocessors to programmable hardware. Uh, and the big stuff, mainframes, supercomputers, cloud computing, quantum computers, but many, many, many computers over here in the uh, microcomputer, microprocessor world, the microcomputers uh, go into PCs, the microprocessors uh, get Im into embedded applications. Your car's probably got 40 uh, embedded processors in it. And here's some of the early ones. This is a PIC-10F, uh, six pin chip. Uh, here's our little board. This is a few generations back. Uh, but it, it's not too far back because it's still surface mount for most of the parts. Okay, I'm going to quit with that, um, and we'll pick up from here and uh, charge on on Thursday, and I will do the soldering demo and some other things. So um, hopefully you've been able to hang in there not fall asleep during this, and, and then you'll be able to, to do the post-video quiz right after this. All right, we'll talk to you later.